man, in chapter 12, Paul has been stressing the nature of gifts, ministries, operations, and their necessity for proper functioning in the church or for the church to proper function to function properly the necessity of those gifts he further shows us through the analogy of the human body as we saw last week that every gift every ministry every member is vitally important to the body there should never be an attitude of inferiority nor superiority the truth is we need each other And without every member doing what they are gifted to do, we will not function properly. Can you say amen? God in his august wisdom has designed the church, the body, to be dependent upon other parts to be healthy, to function correctly. He he wants us to have, and this is hard for some of us, he wants us to have a tremendous sense of dependency He desires that we be dependent upon him, of course, first, but as well, this is the part we don't like, upon each other. Yet, from the very beginning, this has, you know, man has resisted this message of dependency. Do you remember when Cain uh, had slain his brother Abel and God said to him, where is thy brother Abel? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Ever since then, the fall, man has disdained the thought of responsibility for others. I'll take care of me and mine, and then the rest of y'all on your own. That's pretty much the way it goes, right? And not only is it that we feel no responsibility for others, or we don't want to feel responsible, we as well have attitudes that we don't need others, (laughs) We don't need the church. Sadly, some don't feel they need God. But in our culture, uh, we we admire this individual, um, this rugged individualism. And those who achieve individual feats, those who work hard and make it on their own, we admire that. There's something about that that appeals to us. There's something about doing it all alone, all by yourself, with nobody else that says, I have conquered. I don't need anyone else. I'm independent. I'm self-sufficient. That that appeals to us. Or like some people say, I don't need no man. Do you know why that doesn't that you know why that appeals to us, that spirit? Do you do you really want to know why? It's because we are fallen, self-centered, prideful, egotistical. I'll say that one again. Egotistical human beings. Because this is not God's way. You are your brother's keeper, whether you want the responsibility or not. And you, whether you like it or not, pride, you need others. This is especially true in the body of Christ. And to try to make it as a Christian without your brothers and sisters is to cut yourself off from the body, which is a formula for disaster. It is simply not the way the Lord has designed the church to function, the body to function. This is why people, you know, sometimes may, they make the statement, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian They're deceived by that statement. I mean, it's true that you can get saved. You don't have to be in a church to get saved, and and, and, and the church cannot save you. Only Jesus can save your soul. But if you will grow properly, if you will be nourished, if you will be what you ought to be, and if you will do your part as a member of the body of Christ, you have to do it in the context of the local church Christ died for. Amen? Amen. Try it on your own, and you do so at your own peril. God wants us to be a family. He wants us to care one for another. So, you know, we, we, this, this, uh, you know, someone might say, well, Jesus, he was a rugged individualist. I mean, he had power to make it on his own. And yes, he had that kind of power, but did he? Do you realize that Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life living within the family, his own family, and the next three years of his life in ministry spent with 12 men? What about Paul? He was a rugged individualist, right? No. I don't think Paul ever went anywhere without somebody. 
If you read the end of the book of Romans, Paul lists the names of the many people who had helped him, who accompanied him, whom he loved and whom he ministered to and ministered with and, and, they, ministered for, and they ministered for him. And then in Colossians 4, well, there's a list of names of people who ministered and cared and served and traveled uh, with Paul. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, there's, uh, there's more names. In the, uh, in the book of Acts, there's, Paul starts out with Barnabas, then John Mark, then Silas, then Timothy, and then Luke. He always had somebody. Someone was always sharing in the ministry with him. Someone uh, uh, to whom he could minister, someone to whom he could pour out his heart, and someone for whom he could rely upon to be a source of strength to him. There's no place in God's plan or in biblical theology for individualism. There's not, none. Uh, there's no reason to be isolated, to feel isolated, to, 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 to think you're isolated. You, you're, you're not to be a lone ranger, and you are certainly to be your brother's keeper. In fact, here in chapter 12, Paul says, verse 25, but that the members should have the same care for one another. No one, no one should uh, think they, they don't need other people or that they're not needed. Every member, no matter how insignificant their office or gift may appear, is essential to the proper functioning of the body. No one should ever be guilty of believing that she, he or she is unimportant to the body. No one should ever say about another believer or think about another believer, we don't need you. Every member is vital. Every member is important. There are no big eyes. There's no little use. There's only us. And we need each other to function in health and prosper as a body. This is the message. This is the message of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul sums up the chapter in our morning text by stating some important facts. In fact, in verse 27, he says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So Paul's saying, Even as the human body is a unified whole with many different parts, so also is the body of Jesus Christ. Here Paul is unquestionably referring to the local body and suggests that what is applied to the universal church applies to the local church. Each local church is a microcosm of the whole church. So Paul is saying in verse 27, here's what he's really saying, remember your unity. You are a unified body of many parts. So remember that you're a, un un you want, you're a unit. You're, you are together. You must operate and function together, just like the human body. Then in verse 28, Paul's saying, if we read this, you'll see, he's, 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 he's saying, remember your diversity. You are the ones with all these gifts and operations and ministries. He says in chapter 12, verse 28, he says, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Paul is using this list, and it's, again, I want to state, it, it, we, and hopefully we'll see more of this if, if the Lord permits as we go. This list is not exhaustive, but it, it's, it's to illustrate a point um, that we're going to get to momentarily. But let me, before we get to the point that Paul is making, uh, I want to quickly define these gifts. I, I think so many people in the body of Christ, Christ lack teaching on what the gifts are. We already have seen, we have a misunderstanding oftentimes. People don't, they abuse it or they, uh, or they just don't understand and they just neglect it. And I want you to understand, God hasn't ripped pages out of the book and said it's no longer there. It's still here. It's, the gifts are still available. They're still valid. They're still important. And, and let me just talk about this first gift that's much misunderstood, a, a gift, a, a, a ministry, in the church, and it says God has said in the church, first apostles, literally the word apostolos means one sent forth, an ambassador. In ancient Greece, the word was a term associated with ships 
and the sea. And this capacity was used to describe a fleet of ships as being commissioned, hear this, being commissioned and sent out with an intended goal and purpose. It was used the military expeditions in much the same way. And later, it it came to be used to describe a group of colonists who would establish new settlements in distant lands. Therefore, the basic idea expressed by the word apostle is one sent as a representative of another, deriving authority from the sender. Did you hear that? The apostle represents the mission and the purpose of the sender and therefore does not act on his own and do as he pleases. Listen, listen, folks, this is important because in in our our church culture today, there is so much uh, that is wrong, but the apostle is not a guru. He's not superior at the top, giving new revelation. He does not do that. Only, (laughs) this is the only revelation we have. There's no new revelation. And and oftentimes they think, well, we're the only ones qualified to give new revelation. And then because they say it, it's equivalent to God's word. And they feel like they can tell everybody else what to do or what to believe. Let me just say, no, no, no. A thousand times over, no, that's not of God. Let me give you some examples of the word apostle from Scripture. In Luke chapter 9, verse 1, it says, and then we'll look at verse 1 and 2 and then verse 10. It says, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases, and he sent, apostello, he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Verse 10, and the apostles, apostolos, when they return, were returned, told him all that they had done. So I want you to notice they were called disciples when they were with him, but when he sent them out, they were called apostles. You see that? You see that? Luke chapter 10, verse 1 says, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent apostolo, stello, them two and two before his face into every city and place, whether he himself would come. So so you see the idea here of what an apostle is. Now, while I'll agree with those that say the original 12 apostles had a unique apostolic authority and they were sent on a unique special commission, I disagree strongly with those who would say there are no more apostles just because we don't have a full understanding of what they are doesn't mean they're not real. God still has apostles, special ambassadors in the church today. Those who have a pioneering spirit, perhaps as church planners and missionaries who break through new frontiers or who are on special assignment from God. The church still needs that gift today. Can you say amen? What now? Paul goes on, not all are apostles, right? There are some prophets. Now, prophets of today are like apostles. They're not all in the same class. Uh, uh, They're not in the same class today as the prophets and apostles who established doctrine. That's important to understand. No new revelation is ever to be given. The book is complete. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Uh, These played a foundational role and wrote the word of God. There are no more like these in that sense. uh, 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 For Listen, a structure can only have one foundation, and that foundation has been laid. Present apostles or prophets do not write or add to scriptures. There is no new revelation. The canon of Scripture is complete. Nothing else can be added and nothing taken away. Uh, There are, however, prophets today, such as was in the New Testament, like Agabus, Judas, and Silas, uh, that were not of the original 12. The word prophet uh, uh, means to speak for another, to speak for God, one who speaks under divine inspiration for God. And if one will notice, there is a common thread that runs through the message of nearly every prophet 
in the Bible. It represents the heartbeat of their call. Its emphasis could be summarized as this. Turn to the Lord with all your heart. You hear that? That's how you can tell the difference between a prophet and a soothsayer, a guru, okay? Uh, that's how you can know. Now, let me just read. I, I don't have the time to go in depth in all these, but I, I, I want to just give you a, a, so you can have an understanding, maybe whet your appetite to research more. Second Kings chapter 17, verse 13 says, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Time will not permit, but a simple study will verify that this is the work of prophets, true prophets, correct? They exhort and call God's people back to him. Do you hear me? I have a preacher friend that preached in England some time ago, and an old English gentleman said to him after he got done preaching, said, Son, he said to him, he said, hey, you preach like that and you won't have many friends, he said. He said, but you'll be happy. If you'll notice, prophets don't have a whole lot of friends. Amen? Because it's not pleasant when the prophet says you need to turn back to God. You need to smash your idols. You need to come back to that first love. It, it, it don't set so well, so prophets aren't always loved. Come on. Come on. Now, not all are apostles and not all are prophets, but there are prophets and there are apostles when we understand the way they are to, they are to be. And some are teachers. In the New Testament, one who, it means one who teaches concerning the things of God and the duties of man. These were those who were gifted of the Holy Spirit to build up converts who had been won by the preaching of the evangelists and the apostles and the prophets. I'm so grateful for men and women who have taught me over the years and those, let me just say this, nobody's self-made. You, you, you don't, you, you, oh boy, I learn it all on my, you know, you're not self-made and we need to give credit because we're a body and you don't become what you need to be without the body. Come on now. Uh, praise God. I'm grateful for those people who have been in my life who've taught me over the years, some by their teaching, some by their example, but it's all teaching. And those here at CHC, there are spiritually gifted teachers here of the Word of God. And I thank God for those who feed us and explain the Scripture to us and for those who teach our children on a regular basis. Amen? Now... <clears throat> Then Paul says, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings. Now, we've already talked about that a few weeks ago. We've already defined these, and I, so I'm not going to go back through to define them, but I just want to say thank God that the days of miracles are not over. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he still heals the sick. And he still gives power to, to cast out demons. He, is a, he, ha, he still performs miracles. Can you say amen? Praise God. Uh, next, everybody's not an apostle. Everybody's not a prophet. Everybody's not a teacher. Everybody's not a worker of miracles. Everybody doesn't have the gifts of healing. Some have the gift of helps. Huh. The ability to render helpful service, relief, or aid. The plural form helps, no doubt, indicates a variety of expressions of this gift. And maybe, maybe you don't have the gift of teaching or speaking, but perhaps you have the gift of helping. Spurgeon says this regarding the gift of helps. He says, it strikes me that the, those who were using the gift of helps were not persons who had any official standing. They didn't have a title. <laughs> but that they were only moved by the natural impulse and the divine life within them to do anything and everything which would eat, eat which would assist either teacher, pastor, or deacon in the work of the Lord. They are the sort of brethren who are useful anywhere, who can always stop a gap, and who are only too glad when they find that they can make themselves serviceable to the church of God in any capacity, whatever. There is a 
wide scope for the exercise of this gift of helps. Not only can one with this gift assist other ministry gifts, but can exercise the ministry of helps amongst the poor and the sick and the aged and the orphans and widows. It is a gift that affords an endless scope for those who desire to serve the Lord. It is a blessed gift, a gift without which the church cannot survive. Spurgeon also describes the qualities of someone who is effective in the gifts of help. He says, number one, they have a tender heart to really care. Number two, a quick eye to see the need. Number three, a quick foot to get to the needy. Number four, a loving face to cheer them and bless them. Number five, a firm foot so that you will not fall but your, fall yourself. Number six, a strong hand to grip the needy with. And number seven, a bent back to reach the man. An old Puritan preacher once did a great sermon on Bartholomew. I haven't heard of him too much. The title, and Bartholomew. And, we're going to use for a subject today, and Bartholomew. His point was that Bartholomew is never mentioned by himself, but always with the phrase, and Bartholomew. He is always spoken of doing something good with someone else. He was never the leader, always the helper. Let me tell you, friend, you may not be the mouth that speaks or commands, but you can be the feet that go and the hand that reaches out. And one day, let me tell you, when you stand before God, your reward will not be based on what others think of you or if you had a title or if you did this or you, uh, uh, as far as what man thinks. Uh, but you will be judged on how faithful you were to the gift that God bestowed upon you. And man, will you be faithful to that? You'll be just as much rewarded as somebody that's got the title. Amen? Next, some have the gift of governments, or some translations have it, administrations. Again, the plural is used to indicate a variety of expressions of this gift. It simply means to steer, to pilot, to administrate. It was used literally to define the, her, the helmsman of a big cargo ship, uh, uh, and, and of, it was used of the person who steered the ship through the rocks and the shoals and to the harbor. The man, the administrator, the, gov, the, man, the man with the gift, this gift, uh, he, he was able to see where the rocks were. He knew where they were. He, knew, he, he, he knows the capability of the ship. He, he knows the capabilities, uh, the abilities of the crew. And, of course, it's not so easy to try to d define all the particulars of this office or function in the church. Uh, Vincent writes and says it probably refers to administrators of church government. It can refer to even, he says, wise counsel. But I think we can't even limit it to that. There are, it's, it's a broad, I think, a broad uh, expression of this gift in the church. And so that's an important gift. And then last, of the last gifts of, uh, that is mentioned is diversities of tongues. We've already defined it. You could go back if you weren't here and you can, you can hear that message a few weeks ago. It's a supernatural utterance in an unknown tongue. But Paul mentions all of these different gifts, and there's more that's not mentioned. He mentions these different gifts for a purpose. In verse 27, he's saying, remember your unity. You're a body, many members. Here in verse 28, he's saying, remember your diversity. You are the ones with all the different gifts and ministries. Now in verses 29 and 30, he will say basically this, that you need to remember God's sovereignty. See, he doesn't want all of you to be apostles or prophets or teachers or miracle workers, or healers, for everybody to speak in tongues and interpret. Now it says in verse 28, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? The implication is no, no. So he's saying then why are all of you, he's speaking to Corinth, but he's, he's to all of us, why are then all of you trying to be hands and eyes? Why are you esteeming apostles and prophets and teachers and miracle workers and tongue speakers and healers and, you know, all the out 
and front stuff, the showy stuff. Don't you know that God has called some of you to be helpers and workers in areas of government and administration that people can't see and the nursery workers and clean the church and mm, et cetera, et cetera. Some of you are, oh, you want to be, you know, you want to be the eye, you, 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 you want to be the mouth, but some of you are ears and feet. You know, we talk about smelly feet, stinky feet, right? I mean, that's what people, they ain't get no respect. But that's just as important, Paul's saying. It, it's all sovereign. You hear that? It's all sovereign. You have nothing to be envious of, and you have nothing to be proud about, to look down on others. <laughs> I just got the title. I'm Pastor Harney's associate. Oh, boy, I'm in the worst team. I'm, I'm, I'm second lead, right behind Joyce. That's wrong. It's a wrong attitude, wrong spirit. Oh, they need me. <laughs> I'll tell you, God doesn't need any of us. <laughs> Can't do it without me. Oh, yes, he can. Oh, yes, he can. You see, we're all different parts who minister differently because we've been gifted differently, but it's the same God who's at work in us. And here's what I like. He customizes his work through us. <laughs> you like, I mean, just think, I'm custom work. I'm custom made. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Unto good works. He does custom work on us. Hmm. He customizes his work through us for his ultimate glory and for the strength of the church. Let me illustrate. Just around the corner, we are having our annual friends and family day this next month. And this year, thanks to a guy who is very gifted in the area of helps, Charles Clay, comes to our church. And then another fellow we don't even know who has the gift of giving, donated money, for us to do it. Because of them, we're going to have the best-looking picnic shelter in the Miami Valley. Have you looked at that thing? I mean, it's, it's top-notch, top-notch. Now, back, back to the illustration. Let's just suppose someone drops a plate of food, and it's going to happen, or dessert on our brand-new concrete floor that's got coloring in it to make it even look nicer. It's going to happen. Just don't be first. This is how people with different gifts will respond or would respond. The gift of prophecy. That's what happens when you're not careful. The gift of helps. Oh, let me help you clean it up. The gift of teaching. Well, the reason that it fails is because it's too heavy on one side. The gift of exhortation. Next time, maybe you should let someone else carry it. The gift of giving. Here, you can have my dessert. The gift of mercy. Uh, don't feel too bad. <laughs> it could happen to anyone. And then the gift of administration. Emery, would you get the mop, Steve? Please help him pick that up. And Linda, could you give him another dessert? All right? We've all been gifted differently. And so we act differently and we serve differently. Friends, this church has every gift needed in order to function properly. We just need every part working together. Are you doing your part? Or do you not want the responsibility? Just saying. Quiet. I heard a story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, nobody. There, there was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about this because it was everybody's job and everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. (laughs) 
A man approached the pastor and told him he wanted to join the church but didn't think he'd have time to devote to serving. I have a very busy schedule, he said, and can't do any cleaning, teaching, serving, nothing. I can't help people. With, I can't help even with special projects. I, students, kids, my evenings are tied up. The minister thought for a moment and said, I believe you're at the wrong church. And He said, the church you're looking for, he's, he says, about three blocks down on the right. The man left, followed the pastor's directions. Soon he came to an abandoned, boarded up church building. And the point was made. We must all do our part. The church is not a building. You got the wrong idea. Uh, we're going to go to the building. It's not a building. It's a body with many individual parts doing all their functions so that the church is healthy. Listen, you may go to church and not even be the church. Because if all you're doing is coming to a building to hear something and you're not allowing God to use you in your gifts and your functions, helps, whatever it may be. You're just coming to a church, but you're not being his body. Well, that's strong. It sounds like a prophet speaking. No, I'm not saying that I am. I'm just saying that's kind of how that is. Calling you back. Are you using your gifts? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, Paul said, Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Timothy had a gift he was neglecting. And then 2 Timothy, like some of us, Timothy was still not using his gift. So Paul writes a second letter, and he says in chapter 1, verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. Get going, Timothy. You've got it. Use it. Well, essentially, my beloved church family, that's what the Holy Spirit is saying to all of us. You're a believer. You've got a gift. Don't neglect it. Stir it up. Pray until the Holy Spirit energizes you. Don't go a wall. We need you. God needs you. And I know it's hard to admit, but you need us. And we all need Jesus. Amen.